Okay, it's fine. Yeah, all perfect. Okay, okay. Uh, so shall we get started? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you, uh, Samuel. Uh, hi again, everybody. Um, today, I would like to uh, continue a little bit of the discussion we had on Tuesday, uh, but this time focus it uh, uh, towards the concept of polarons, okay? So I'm sure that uh, uh, all of us have some kind of intuitive notion of uh, polar in our mind. Uh, so during this talk, let's pretend that we don't know anything and then uh, let's restart from scratch and try to understand uh, how to perform calculations of these objects, okay? So the lecture is, is structured in, in, uh, in, the, in the following part. First, I will introduce the, this concept of polarons uh, in a very uh, simple way. Then I will uh, uh, summarize a few experiments that happened uh, um, that were performed during the past maybe eight years that showed very interesting signatures of polarons. Um, so those really are experiments that reignited interest in these particles. And then uh, uh, I will discuss uh, some techniques to calculate polarons satellites from uh, you know, using many approaches. And finally, uh, I will go to um, a uh, new approach to look at polarons using density functional theory and trying to get to the wave functions, the formation energy, and all these things, okay? Uh, if there is a little bit of time left, I will uh, explain what are the present problems and challenges that uh, one has to address to, to better understand polarons. So to get started, let me uh, just uh, show you this uh, couple of figures. These are from um, a uh, review uh, paper written by uh, Cesare Franchini and his co-workers. This was published uh, maybe a couple of months ago in Nature Review Materials, and I strongly recommend it because it's uh, a, a very comprehensive uh, you know, summary of what, uh, uh, you know, how polarons manifest themselves in, uh, in, uh, in materials. Uh, so it's a very up-to-date uh, uh, literature review. It's very interesting, uh, very interesting read. So the, the figure on the left shows the intuitive concept of polarons. So what we have in mind is that um, you have an insulating crystal, uh, maybe a, a Y-gap semiconductor or an oxide, and uh, you add an extra electron, for example, and uh, the electron flow interaction is strong enough that uh, the electron will uh, drag some of the atoms around itself. And as a result, it may form a localized object, okay? Uh, so in this picture, the localized object is very, very small. And uh, uh, in this, let's say, cartoonish example, uh, the, the main consequence of this effect is that uh, uh, the electron will be a little bit stuck in this uh, lattice site. So if it wants to move uh, towards a, a neighboring lattice site, it will encounter some kind of potential energy barrier like this, okay? So the, the, the cartoon on the right uh, shows this uh, process of going from uh, one side to the next one, where the electron is localized on site one at the beginning, and then has to overcome a barrier to go to the other side. Here it stretches a little bit, and then it localizes on site two. So this is a, a, an exaggerated picture of what might happen if you find the small polarons in, in a material. And that's the kind of things that uh, uh, you know, we would like to be able to describe at some point. So what is the uh, practical uh, manifestation of, of this uh, uh, kind of phenomena? I think the, the most spectacular manifestation uh, is found in transport measurements, okay? So in this slide, I'm showing you two examples from experiments. So the left half of the screen is about the titanium dioxide in the anatase phase. So this is the atomic structure. You have titanium in the middle, oxygen in the corners, and then some of the either are corner sharing and some are uh, edge sharing. And then the right hand side of the uh, uh, slide has uh, uh, titanium dioxide again, but in the rutile polymorph. So it looks like this. So the, the difference between the left and right is the connectivity of the octahedra. So those two uh, uh, um, polymorphs have slightly different bus structures, and generally the effective mass in rutile are much heavier. So if you go performing transport measurements, uh, uh, so these are whole, uh, uh, all whole measurements, so like uh, resistivity uh, measured by whole effect. For anatase, what you discover is that as a function of temperature, the, temp the resistivity increases. So this is exactly the same behavior that you found yesterday in the calculations on lead and uh, uh, cubic boron nitride, okay? So yesterday you were looking at the mobility and the conductivity. So the resistivity is the reciprocal of the quantity. So that increases with temperature because you are increasing the, uh, the let's say the amplitude of the uh, atomic uh, vibrations and therefore the, uh, the intensity of electron phenomena scattering. If one goes to rutile, uh, there is something interesting happening, and that's it, the, the fact that uh, the resistivity goes down with temperature instead of going up. So this behavior is not captured by uh, the formalism that we have, uh, that Samuel has discussed yesterday, uh, uh, simply because the, the nature of the uh, uh, electrons that we consider to start with is no longer uh, 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 
kind of adequately described by block uh, like extended delocalized wave functions. Okay, so in this case, we say that uh, we have diffusive transport, uh, like the Boltzmann transport that we seen yesterday. In this other case, we we talk about activated transport. So just to um, uh, uh, make it clear, so we are nowhere near uh, uh, modeling this kind of behavior. We are barely starting to understand how to calculate colons. Okay, so this would be the long term goal, but I think we are still quite far away from this. Now let me go through the experiments that I mentioned uh, as soon as when I when I opened the talk. So um, starting from 2013, we had a series of very beautiful uh, experiments, which are photomission experiments. So angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy measurements uh, that uh, essentially showed uh, the uh, existence of some new features in bus structures of, of insulators um, that have been attributed to the formation of polarons. Okay, and these experiments really. Uh, kick started a lot of effort uh, on the theory side and the experimental side to better understand polarons. So, the Anarpes experiment, uh, uh, for those who are not aware of what happens here, uh, is, a, uh, you know, is a very complex experiment, but uh, conceptually, the idea is uh, very simple. It is based on the photoelectric effect, meaning that uh, one shines light on a sample. This could be a laser of a synchron light uh, source. And by the photoelectric effect, uh, this light can extract electrons. These electrons are channeled into a hemispherical analyzer and then collect into a detector. The power of these measurements is that uh, uh, the image that you collect in a CCD camera, the detector, essentially tells you the, uh, uh, the bus structure of uh, uh, this uh, uh, sample. Okay, so that's why it's so powerful. So with these experiments, one can measure uh, as essentially one can perform the most direct observation of bus structures of materials. So uh, during the uh, early uh, uh, 2010, what uh, uh, some groups started uh, looking into is not just to characterize uh, uh, systems like uh, uh, graphene or you know, kind of 2D materials, but also moving towards oxides. Now, if you want to study the conduction band of an oxide, the problem is that uh, uh, by definition, that would be empty. So you cannot extract any electrons from the conduction. So to see the conduction band, one has to uh, dope some electrons into it. And uh, if you assume that you can dope a little bit of electrons, maybe 10 to 18, 10 to 20 electrons per cube centimeter, you might be able to find a little bit of a parabolic band minimum for an oxide. And that should be uh, what your ARP spectrum gives you. In practice, uh, the experiments I'm going to show you in the next three slides uh, uh, did not find uh, uh, this picture, as I've just shown you. But there was also some extra features. And these features looked like some uh, additional mini bands that you can see below the conduction band. So this would be inside the band gap. And uh, those were actually very interesting because they looked a, li a little bit like the main band, but they were uh, uh, almost like echoes of the main band separated by specific energies, like uh, multiples of a given energy from this band. So these have been called polaron satellites. So let me give you uh, uh, the examples now. So this is the first experiments from the group of um, uh, Professor Guioni in uh, IPAT EPFL Lausanne in 2013. So they doped, uh, uh, they photo doped uh, uh, anatase titanium dioxide and uh, they obtained this spectra. So let's focus on the left one. So the blue thing is the conduction band bottom. Okay. So this would be uh, what we would expect from a DFT calculation. On top of that, they observed this, uh, this little lamp here that is not predicted by DFT calculations. Okay. So that's essentially a satellite. And if you look at the energy difference between quasi particle and uh, the satellite, it's approximately 110 milliwatt. And uh, by coincidence, that uh, is, uh, looks like the characteristic longitudinal uh, 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 optical phonon energy in titanium dioxide. Okay, similar story here and here. Uh, and the bottom line is that there are some extra features that we do not capture using our DFT band structure. This is the experiment that I showed you um, on uh, Tuesday when I wanted to uh, uh, comment on the breakdown of the uh, uh, elementary perturbation theory. Also, in this case, this is an experiment from Baumbergen in, in Geneva. They obtained a uh, for strontium titanate a conduction band bottom. Uh, then there was a, a first satellite, second satellite, faint third satellite. And these are all separated by uh, the main quasi particle band by an integer multiple of phonon energies. Okay, so that's actually a, a, a confirmation of what uh, uh, was seen in the previous experiment. Maybe just to give you uh, one last uh, uh, example. So this is an experiment performed by the group of Phil Kim. It was, uh, uh, you know, where we also contributed with the theory. And uh, what they did is to uh, uh, grow uh, rock salt, European oxide, that is only stable at low temperature, and uh, dope it with gadolinium. So Europium has two electrons uh, in, the in the, you know, conduction electrons, and then, uh, uh, sorry, two electrons in the valence. 
and gadolinium has three electrons, therefore uh, uh, the gadolinium doping leads to electron doping in the conduction band. So you perform r based measurements, uh, you will see the, the, this band here, okay, as the signal. Then these other bands are the European F states here. And then here there seems to be nothing, but that's just because the signal of the valence band is so strong. So if you just remove these bands and you zoom in, you find the conduction band. And again, there is a little bit of a uh, quasi-particle band, then a first satellite, then a second satellite. These times they are separated by approximately 60 millivolt, which is the longitudinal optical form of energy in European oxide. Okay. So all these three experiments are consistently point to the existence of uh, uh, satellites uh, uh, associated with you know, some kind of phonon energies uh, in a broad range of materials. There are more other, many more other experiments that uh, I will not describe, but this seems to be a general feature of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, these uh, uh, doped uh, uh, insulators. So let's try to see whether we can describe these using the techniques that I uh, introduced on uh, Tuesday. So I told you on Tuesday that if you use a family that's set for energy uh, for a metal, uh, you obtain a distortion of the bands that uh, up happens on a uh, energy scale of the order of the phonon energy, okay? So yellow will be the undistorted, uh, like the unperturbed band, and the red will be the perturbed band structure. The kink has to do with this electron phonon interaction. Now in this uh, 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 kind of schematic, we are thinking, we're assuming that the uh, phonon frequency is much smaller than the Fermi energy. So you need to imagine that in this plot, the Fermi energy would be a couple of feet below the screen, okay? So it's much further down. Now, if you dope an insulator, you will have a very, very tiny Fermi level, okay? So the situation will be such that the phonon energy is comparable with the Fermi energy. So in this case, uh, the Fermi energy will be approximately here. So what is it gonna happen if you use the Fermi that's self energy? Something interesting happens, and basically what happens is that uh, the, the kink on the right-hand side here merges with the kink on the left-hand side, reconstructing a quasi-particle band in the middle, okay? And uh, in this process, uh, whatever was left as a, the incoherent part here merges into something that looks like a satellite. So this is to say that even in an extremely simplified model, just a parabolic band interacting with a, a single phonon, you obtain a, a, a situation where there is a quasi-particle band and a satellite, one satellite in this case. Now, the problem with this approach is that uh, in the experiments, the satellite appears at that energy separation between the quasi-particle and the satellite, which is at the form of energy approximately, or a multiple than energy. While here, you see that the satellite is a little bit further down. So this is a problem of the family that's self-energy, and in practice, it means that we need to do something more to be uh, uh, predictable. So the way these calculations uh, uh, are done, and this has been done now by us and many other groups uh, 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 up to this point, is to restart from uh, where we left uh, uh, on Tuesday and use the family that's self energy. And then uh, uh, once you calculate that, and you can do that, for example, with the PW code or with other codes like Abinit, um, uh, you need to uh, go a little bit beyond and uh, uh, describe a little bit of this uh, vertex here. So the way it, this is done these days is using something called the cumulant expansion method which is a, uh, a, a way to incorporate some uh, 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 electron phonon coupling diagrams that are missing in the simple uh, uh, family that's self-energy, okay? So now uh, uh, I should say that this looks, uh, you know, uh, the name cumulant expansion uh, sounds very fancy and uh, you know, the, the, the representation in terms of the diagram sounds even fancier, but uh, from a computational standpoint, uh, the operation of performing a cumulant expansion is extremely simple. Uh, in practice, uh, what one does is to compute the family that's self energy. Once you have that information, you can simply uh, 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 perform a post processing operation on that and obtain the cumulant spectral function. So, for example, in EPW, there is a subroutine that reads the family that's self energy, manipulates it a little bit, and then gives you the, the spectral function in the cumulant method. So, this is to say that the calculation of cumulant spectra is uh, uh, as expensive as the calculation of family that's self energy because it's just a, a very, very simple post processing operation. So let me show you what happens if you apply this methodology. So this is the uh, experiments on uh, titanium dioxide I mentioned a few slides ago. And this is a calculation performed by uh, Carla Verdi a few years ago, where you see the first uh, quasi-particle band, the first satellite, the second satellite. Now in this picture is a little bit difficult to discern the details. So what one can do is to track the maxima. And if you track the maximum of all these bands, you find the first red line here, second line, third line. So this would be the quasi-particle band. And these will be the two uh, uh, satellites that I have discussed, okay? So the bottom line here is that uh, there is a way to uh, be predictive and to uh, uh, perform calculations that are in reasonably good agreement with experiments in this case. 
Just to give you another example, if you look at the case of European MOXI, so these are calculations performed by Fabio Caruso. So these are the um, uh, uh, spectral functions uh, in the experiment. These are the spectral functions in the fan middle plus cumulant method. And maybe it's difficult to see what happens here, but if you take line cuts in the middle here, so that's maybe the conductor and bottom, and you plot it along the energy axis, you see the first bit in yellow, that is for quasi particle peak, it will be this one here. Then the first satellite here is this one here. And then the second satellite will be this one. If you look at the calculations, you find a similar phenomenology, quasi particle peak, satellite, satellite. Okay? So now there is something that I want to do to improve also the intensity of satellites, but you know, I will stop here for this. And I just want to mention what happens next. So at this point, once uh, you, you, you have this calculation discussed with experimentalists, so typically the, uh, the next question is the following. Okay, you can calculate the spectral function. Can you now tell me how the polaron looks like? And then where the that's where the trouble starts, because uh, uh, even if you try to think very hard, I mean, uh, uh, actually probably you will not find a way to extract the uh, polar wave function from this uh, spectral function, okay? So, and that's basically for us was the beginning of a long journey to try to understand how to get polar wave functions. Another question that uh, arises is the following. Uh, some uh, uh, colleagues asked us, well, since these uh, the spectra are localized in momentum space, can we do a Fourier transform and obtain from this the real space extent of the polar from these functions? Well, the answer is no, because this localization does not reflect the polar on size, but it reflects the size of the Fermi wave vector, okay? So the feeling or the Fermi level by doping, okay? So there is a lot of information here, but one has to be very careful in how to interpret it. Now, um, uh, how do we understand then these uh, satellites if, uh, uh, you know, these things are a little bit uh, uh, complicated? Well, the best way I had to explain it is the following. In a photo emission experiment, you need to imagine that there is a, a photon coming into a material, let's say that it is titanium dioxide. And if uh, you have enough energy, you can extract one electron. Okay, so the atom gets uh, pulled out of the material. So if you extract an electron, what happens is that you leave behind one hole, okay, a, a lack of electron. So this hole will be positively charged and it will interact the four with all the ionic charges surrounding it. So a positive charge interacting with the ions nearby, what it will do is to trigger a wave of uh, the vibrations uh, of the material uh, uh, surrounding it. And these waves will propagate radially away from this uh, uh, excitation, okay? So really the way to understand the satellites is that the satellites really mean this uh, shake up excitations of the crystal once you remove or add one electron to it, okay? So uh, the bottom line is that uh, uh, although very powerful and uh, uh, beautiful, these experiments on photo emission on, on polarons uh, needs to be interpreted carefully. And the, the main uh, message here is that the satellites do not represent the polar on per se, but they represent the, the shake up excitation of the, uh, you know, of the electron uh, plus photon uh, uh, system, okay? So if you want to assign, um, uh, you know, uh, tell which uh, energy corresponds to the polar, we should say that the polar is essentially the quasi particle peak. And at this point, we are left with the question, okay, uh, let's assume that's the case. How do we look at the wave function of the polar and how do we decide whether that is localized or not? So let's try to understand how to do this uh, using a very simple model. And then uh, uh, let's go through, uh, we will go to a very simple uh, uh, kind of mathematical model of this, and then we'll move to DFT calculations, okay? So to make a, uh, to close the loop. So what we are really have in mind probably if you, we, when we think about polar is that uh, you have an insulating crystal and uh, maybe the valence bands are completely filled and uh, the conduction is empty, so you want to add an electron and see what happens. So let's assume that this is a, this cartoon like in, on Tuesday is the, uh, represent the atomic sites, so the dots, and the Konshan potential, let's go to the FT, let's say, and this is the, the potential we have. So if I add an electron and I look for the ground state uh, and I keep my atoms uh, immobile, okay, I don't let them move, well, uh, uh, the potential is this one. So this is, would be the, the bus structure of the system that for the minimum energy corresponds to the electrons sitting at the conduction band bottom. And uh, since it belongs to the band, uh, this would be a delocalized electron like a block state. Now let's assume that I move the atoms here a little bit uh, uh, closer to each other to the middle of the, uh, middle of the page. If I do that, that will cause a deformation of the potential because of the dipolar potential that we discussed on Tuesday, okay? So now there are two cases that could happen. So the first case is that this uh, deformation here is so shallow that uh, it acts as a scattering potential. So the electron wave function will be slightly deformed in this region, but otherwise the electron remains fully delocalized. 
The other possibility is that uh, the uh, potential is deep enough to admit some bound electronic states. In this case, the electron will become localized. And since it is localized, it cannot live in the bus structure. It has to be in the middle of the gap. Okay, so that's probably what we would call a, a, a electron self trap, you know, or a, a, a self trap uh, polar. So what we want to do now is to try to understand the mathematics of this operation, starting from a simple model, and then we will repeat these mathematics using a, 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 a addition method. Okay. So the simplest model to study this phenomenology actually was proposed uh, in 1946 by Solomon Pecker. So it's something very, very old. So the beauty of this model is that it contains most of the physics that uh, we see in uh, uh, initial density functional theory calculations. That's why I want to describe it. So at the time, they didn't have DFT, so they didn't have computers. So the point is that uh, uh, they need to do something simple. So what he proposed is to consider a, a hybrid quantum classical model where the electron is uh, described uh, uh, in a quantum way and the atoms, the ions, are described classically using the dielectric screening of the lattice. So for the electron, we add in the total energy a kinetic energy that has to do with the electron wave function. And we incorporate a bit of information about the bus structure via the effective mass. Okay, we made in a parabolic mass. So this electron will interact with the lattice and uh, to in consider this interaction, the Pekar incorporated this as the energy of the electrostatic field uh, uh, built into the uh, crystal. Okay, now the question is how does this wave function and the fields relate? Well, the answer actually is very simple because we know that uh, the uh, divergence of the displacement field has to be equal to the density of free carriers. But we only have one free carrier, which is the extra wave function, the extra electron. But then we also have the constitutive relations that, that tell us that the displacement field is given by the electric field times the um, dielectric constant of the medium. Okay. So you can invert these two relations in order to obtain a simple expression of the integral in terms of the wave function. And the expression reads as follows. So you have this. Uh, energy of the electrostatic field, it's essentially a integral of the Hartree type, so wave function, wave function, divided the distance between these two points, and uh, it contains some prefactors that, that have to do with the dielectric screen. So that's a very simple way to relate the electrostatic energy to the uh, electron wave function. So now there is one correction that take a reply to this because epsilon naught is the dielectric constant of the crystal, including both the electronic and the ionic contribution. However, the electronic screening was already considered when uh, uh, replacing the electron mass by the effective mass. Okay, so one has to remove the electronic screening to be consistent with this assumption, and therefore one does the one over epsilon zero minus one over epsilon infinity, where epsilon infinity is the high frequency dielectric constant. That means the one where, with the, where the atoms are not moving at all. Okay, so uh, what do you do now with this integral and with this uh, uh, kinetic energy? You can combine them together. You obtain a functional of the wave function of this polar. And if you have a function now, uh, the first thing you do is to take functional derivatives in order to determine some kind of uh, 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 differential equation. If you take into account the normalization of the wave function, that will lead to a Lagrange multiplier that uh, will appear as a uh, eigenvalue. So that is uh, the differential equation that results from this energy function. So you see that there is a kinetic energy, and then there is some kind of potential energy acting on the wave function, but the potential energy contains the wave function itself. So this is a nonlinear uh, differential equation of the third order, okay? And uh, if you solve it, you should be able to find something that tells us whether the electron wants to localize or not. Now, the solution, uh, the exact solution is uh, uh, not known, but there are uh, very simple techniques to find uh, good approximate solutions. So the simplest way to do it is to uh, 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 perform a variation and minimization of the energy, meaning that I choose a form of the wave function, uh, you know, with contain some parameters, and then I, I calculate the energy for this wave function, and then I minimize it to find the smallest possible eigenvalue and total energy, okay? So what is the, 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 the idea here? That Pekar uh, thought that uh, since this looks like a Schrodinger equation, why don't we use the wave function of the hydrogen atom, okay? So it started from a exponential function, so it's an ansatz, where the wave function is uh, exponential over minus the distance for a, from a given center divided a characteristic size. So obviously this needs to be normalized, but it really depends only on one parameter, which is the RP, which uh, means the radius of the polar, or if you want the size of this polar, okay? So that's not exact, but it's something uh, uh, that we could use as a variational answer. If you replace this in the function I gave you in the previous slide, you find the following. So let's put the energy here and the size of the polar here. 
So the first time was the kinetic energy. If you replace this wave function, you find that extremely simple expression, which is one divided the size square. So if you plot it, it's going to be this blue line. And that means that if you want to minimize the kinetic energy, you want the polar to be as large as possible. Okay, so kinetic energy favors delocalization as usual. If you replace the same function in the uh, uh, electrostatic integral, you discover that you find this term here, which goes as one divided the size and it has a minus sign, so it's the red line. So this means that to minimize the Coulomb energy, you want the polar to be um, as small as possible. So Coulomb favors uh, uh, localization. Now, the interesting bit is that since the trends at infinity are one over R squared and one over R, and they are a different sign, those two will lead, to, when you add them up, will lead to the formation of a minimum, okay? So in this simple mathematical model, there is always a minimum uh, that is more stable than the fully delocalized solution that would happen uh, uh, towards infinity here, okay? So in this landau picker model, uh, 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 you can always find a localized polar, and the size of localization will depends on uh, these uh, simple parameters of your system. Now, uh, uh, since uh, there are uh, 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 some uh, materials parameters, uh, uh, let's see what uh, is involved. We have the, the effective mass of the, your uh, insulator, and you have the dielectric constant here, okay? So your polar on radius will be a function of those two quantities. In the polar on literature, uh, what people like to do is to condense this kind of information in a single parameter that has become so ubiquitous that now everything is uh, usually discussed in terms of this single parameter. So uh, to be complete, let me introduce this parameter. That is called the polar on coupling constant, okay? It contains this uh, information about the dielectric screen that I gave in the previous slide, information about the effective mass, and also typically people add information about a characteristic phonon frequency of the compound. So the polar on coupling constant is larger if you have uh, uh, um, high, basically heavier effective masses or lower phonon frequencies, or if there is a significant screening uh, coming from the atomic uh, uh, nuclear. So if the system has a strong infrared uh, activity, okay? So just to give you an idea, this is parameter is dimensionless and it takes values, let's say in the order of between zero and maybe uh, six, seven or something like that for a broad range of materials. So this is a, a table that I pulled out of this uh, review paper just to give you an idea of where this parameter sits, okay? And that, uh, in a few slides, I will discuss the case of lithium fluoride that we picked up just because uh, in this table, it was the one with the strongest, um, uh, uh, let's say, polar on coupling constant, so it would have been easier for us to, to, to investigate it, okay? So that's the, 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 uh, the coupling constant. How do parameters scale? How do properties of the polar scale with this coupling constant? I'm gonna just show you the, the, the size of the polar. If you do the maths, uh, as I showed you earlier, you find that the polar on size scales as one divided the polar on coupling constant. Meaning if the polar on coupling constant goes to infinity, you have an extremely small polar. If the polar on coupling constant goes to zero, you have a fully delocalized block electron. So that would be the trend that you see here. And here I have the parameters from, for lithium fluoride. So this is uh, the, uh, the kind of polar on size in angstrom that you would expect depending on the alpha parameter of this material, okay? So the important observation here is that this model is consistent with, you know, let's say the block band theory in the sense that uh, uh, if you don't have, uh, if you have a very weak uh, uh, coupling, you will have a, uh, such a delocalized polar that basically will behave like a block state, okay? So uh, what we would like to do now is to try to discuss how to implement this idea in, a, in, a, in a DFT calculations. And, uh, uh, you know, it comes to no surprise the fact that uh, you may try to do calculations of polarons starting from DFT uh, using very simply a supercell. So you take a supercell uh, of an insulator, uh, you add one electron, and instead of performing an atomic relaxation using, uh, you know, with the atoms all, uh, sorry, electronic relaxation with atoms all stuck in the equilibrium position, you can let them go and relax, okay? So these are calculation uh, from uh, this paper uh, on uh, lithium uh, uh, peroxide, which is a, a material found in, in, uh, in lithium ion batteries. It is a uh, lithium oxide layers uh, intercalated by lithium uh, uh, cations, okay? So if you perform a standard PDE calculation with the atoms at equilibrium, or even an HSC calculation with atoms at equilibrium, you will find that the conduction band bottom when you add an electron uh, looks like the following, okay? It's a fully delocalized electronic state as uh, we are used to. Now, if instead you start uh, uh, modifying the position of the atoms to make them a little bit closer to each other, like in the cartoon I showed you, what you discover is that uh, this object will favor a, a ground state that is actually localized, like in this picture, all right? 
So in principle, you know, uh, this picture is telling us that, uh, yeah, okay, we can just use DFT to perform the calculations of a, a polar normal function. So we don't need to go all the way to many body fields. Well, this is actually uh, 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 not exactly what happens because uh, if you want to do DFT calculations on the polarons, you face two major challenges. In practice, uh, if you ever tried uh, to calculate polarons using this technique, uh, what you will have discovered uh, is the following. First, is a, if you do a calculations, uh, for example, with PB, uh, you probably will never find the uh, localized polarons, okay? And uh, then you need to resort to something a little bit more uh, uh, stronger, let's say, that like a DFT plus U or uh, hybrid functionals. And in that case, you may find the localized solutions like uh, small polarons maybe. However, uh, the next thing you discover is that if you change the, uh, maybe the Hubbard parameter or the exchange, uh, the fraction of exact exchange, the polar will start to uh, change in size and energy, okay? So there is not a, a, a unique way to decide, you know, what exchange fraction or uh, U parameter do you need to, to, to get the predictive calculation of the polar. So in practice, uh, uh, there is a problem where the polar is extremely sensitive to uh, the choice of the exchange and correlation function, okay? Much more than things like uh, total energies or uh, structures of compounds, okay? So that's a, a, a big problem. Another problem is that uh, uh, if you need a supercell every time, uh, and you don't know what uh, kind of polarons your material will host, uh, uh, you may try to do calculations and assume that since you don't find any localized, uh, uh, your system does not emit local polarons. But actually, what that could mean is that simply your supercell is not big enough. Or maybe if your supercell is already three, 4,000 atoms, you don't want to test a, a supercell with 20 or 30,000 atoms. So you will stop and conclude maybe that there is no polar, but actually maybe the system has a polar and just a little bit bigger, you didn't capture it. So at this point, what we decided to do is to try to find a way to uh, address these questions uh, uh, using a simpler approach uh, that uh, uh, where we can have more control on the electron photon interaction and things can be done uh, in a mathematically slightly more uh, compact uh, uh, form, okay? So let me uh, explain uh, uh, the, the approach that we followed. Uh, and uh, I think it's easy enough that I can uh, really show you the derivation in, in two steps. So the idea is that uh, you take the total energy in DFT, which is kinetic energy, R3, exchange and correlation, uh, electron uh, ion interactions and ion ion interactions. Okay. So this would be pseudo potentials in reality, but uh, let's uh, keep it as Coulomb, bare Coulomb, just for simplicity. Let's assume that this is a, a system uh, with valence bands completely filled and then uh, nothing in the conduction. Now you add one electron in the conduction and want to see what happens. So let's see what happens at the formal level. So what we need to do is to change the electron density by adding uh, the extra electron wave function. And maybe the atoms will move, uh, let's say that the new position will be the old position plus some displacement. So what I need to do is to replace those two things inside these expressions. So let's do it. For the kinetic energy, I will have the ground state kinetic energy plus this extra bit coming from the extra electron. For the R3 energy, I just need to add the extra uh, electron charge here and here. And then for the exchange correlation, again, I need to add an extra uh, electron density here. Now for the uh, ionic electron interaction and for the ion ion interaction, I just need to take into account that the density has changed with an extra bit and the atomic positions have also possibly changed, okay? There is uh, some displacement here and here. So this is basically uh, what we wanted to, to, to do. In, in practice, uh, this is still equivalent to a full DFT calculation, but that's difficult to control. And this contains a problem that is called the self-interaction that you can see here. So if you take the product of this function, with this function, you're basically saying that your polar is interacting with itself. And this, I will, as I will show you a, a little bit later, leads to a complete delocalization. So what we did at this point is to uh, uh, manipulate this functional in order to remove the self-interaction. And then we perform a further simplification in order to use a standard technology for electron phonon physics. So what we did in practice is to expand this functional to second order in the wave function and to second order in the dis displacements, okay? So this allows us to uh, recast the whole problem into a new functional that contains only the uh, wave function of the polar and the displacements uh, in this uh, polaronic state. Just to be explicit, H uh, sub Ks is the constant Hamiltonian in the ground state without the polar. DV in K is the potential perturbation and C is the matrix of interatomic force constants that was described uh, on Monday by uh, Paul Janots. So here you see the picture of Denis uh, That's because uh, the, the form I'm describing here is uh, essentially the main result of his PhD thesis uh, 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 when he was in my group and now he's a, a researcher at the University of uh, Macau. 
So this is a new functional uh, that uh, uh, tells us the energy of the uh, this object as compared to the energy of the ground state. Okay, so if this is negative, it means that we have a more stable state that is uh, not the ground state with the electron fully delocalized. Again, if you have a functional, what is the first reaction of any physicist is to take the functional derivatives to find minima. So if you take functional derivatives with psi star, for example, this term will give you Hamiltonian times psi. This term will give giving the tau psi times displacement, and this will drop. So if I do that, I will obtain this first equation. Then here we'll have an eigenmilotan wave function. The eigenmilotan comes from the uh, constraint on the normalization of the wave function. If I take the derivative instead with respect to displacement, this will be a constant, and this will contain displacement to first order. So this can be inverted explicitly, at least to this equation where I have displacement equal inverse of the dynamic of the matrix of first constants times this linear coupling between uh, the, the phonons and the wave function. So in practice, what I'm saying is that we found a linear, so a couple nonlinear system of equations that might describe, you know, polar and wave function and displacements in a controlled way without having problems like uh, the dependence on the exchange of correlation functional, in particular the self-interaction uh, problem. Okay. So this solves the problem of self-interaction, but uh, it does not solve the problem of the supercell. So if this polar wants to be something that expands maybe a, a 50 or 10 or 30 unit cells, maybe I will need uh, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 atoms, and that's not practical. However, uh, uh, what one can do at this point is to use a trick that is very common in the study of accidents. Uh, so when you want to study accidents, uh, you don't actually perform calculation on very large supercells. You expand the exciton wave functions as a coherent superpositions of block states. So the idea here was very simply to perform the same trick and write the polar wave functions as a coherent superposition of block states. And the, 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 the coefficient, this, this expansion are uh, our unknown, okay? is what defines the polar. So I'm gonna call them A. For the same reason, I can uh, 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 explain, uh, write the displacement of every atom in a big supercell as a linear superposition of uh, uh, the uh, eigen modes uh, of the dynamical matrix, okay? So because they are a, a complete basis in the, com in the space of atomic displacements in the entire crystal. So I will call the coefficients of the expansion B. So in practice, what we have is that we replace the search for uh, the wave function in a supercell into the search for new coefficients. If you replace the expressions in what I gave you before, so in, in this equation, you find two new equations that uh, we call the ab initial polar equations. So the reasons why uh, these are convenient from a computational standpoint is very simply the following. So if you look carefully, the blue and red are the unknown. So what we would like to calculate. So what are the ingredients that we need? Well, the ingredients are the epsilon sub nk, so these are the bus structures, the omega sub q mu, these are the phonon dispersion relations, and the g uh, of uh, kq, which are the electron phonomatic segment. So these three sets of ingredients is precisely what we have been discussing during the school. And this is what is available in, a, a, for example, a code like the Quantum Espresso or PW, okay? So using the standard ingredient, it should be possible to perform these uh, solutions. So let me uh, give you an example uh, for lithium fluoride. And uh, we have chosen this because uh, it is one of the strongly, uh, most strongly coupled uh, polaronic systems that uh, you know, are, are known today. So in practice, what you have to do is, to, uh, if I go back a second, in here you have summations over the, the, the brilliant zone. Uh, uh, so that means that uh, we use a brilliant zone grid, for example, uh, five by five by five. If uh, you, we use this grid, that means that we are solving uh, in real space in an equivalent supercell which has which spans five by five by five unit cells. Okay. So if you have a denser grid, you are accessing a larger supercell. So for each supercell size, we need to see whether we have solutions. So we start from the left on this plot. So this is the energy compared to the core, to the fully delocalized state. So you add an electron to the conduction band of lithium fluoride, you calculate the energy in the FT with the delocalized electron, and then that sets the zero. So if you find a value in the polaronic equation that is below zero, it means that it's a state that is more stable and is a, a lower energy, okay? If you use a seven by seven by seven unit cell, you find zero, meaning that the, the ground state is the delocalized uh, uh, blocks function. Same idea here for eight, for nine, 10, 10, 10, 11, 11, 11. So up to this point, there is no polarons in sight, okay? As you cross this uh, kind of boundary, you start uh, reaching 12 by 12 by 12, which is uh, a size of essentially 12 by 12 by 12 equivalent unit cells. And here you see that there is a negative value that is below zero, okay? 
So that means that there is a state that is 0.2 electron more, more stable than the constant state. And this is really probably a localized state. Now, the, the surprise is that if you keep going uh, and you use uh, larger and larger supercells, what happens is that your energy keeps drifting and becomes lower and lower and lower, okay? And here, what you can see is that um, uh, this axis is the inverse of the size of the supercell, so it's one of the size of the supercell. So this scales as one divided by the size of the supercell, and you can extrapolate to infinity, tell, giving me that the again value is going to be minus 0.8 electromoles, and the formation energy, so total energy difference is minus 0.2 with respect to the ground state, okay? So how do we understand this phenomenon? So the answer is extremely simple, and we can be explained with this cartoon. So let's say that these squares are our large supercell, okay? It contains a lot of small unit cells. Let's imagine that the size of the polaron is given by this uh, a circle that is filled in uh, yellow, okay? Now, if the supercell size is smaller than the size that the polaron wants to be in the crystal, what is gonna happen is that the polaron will overlap with its neighboring replicas, and they will form bonding and bonding orbitals here. So it will tend to delocalize because of the formation of these bonds. And in practice, the, uh, this will lead to complete delocalization when you perform the self-consistent solution. So when you're in this regime, you don't have any polar uh, solution. Now, when the size of the supercell, this square, exceeds the natural side of the polar, then this overlap is completely suppressed and therefore you can host localized objects. And that's why you start seeing uh, negative energies here. So why does the energy goes down now with size of the supercell? That's because these are charged objects sitting in a periodic array, and therefore the phenomenology is the same as you find in the calculation of charge defects in supercells. So you have the Coulomb interaction between point charges. As the point charges go further and further away, the, this interaction goes down as one of the size of the supercell. So this is what is called the Madelung energy, okay? So what happens in practice is that the wave function is completely, so is uh, almost unchanged if you uh, are in this range, but the energy keeps drifting because uh, you have this uh, neighboring uh, interaction between neighbors, okay? So that's uh, for the energy. So what do you do uh, now with this object? Well, maybe we can look at the wave function that we obtained from this uh, uh, expression I gave you before. So this is the uh, uh, calculated wave function for an electron polar and lithium fluoride. And what you can see, uh, so this is actually the square modulus of the wave function. What you can see is that uh, this spans one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 unit cells. A unit cell is approximately two angstroms in this compound. So that's about 22 angstroms in size, okay? So we would say that this is some kind of an intermediate side polar. Just to give you an idea, if you were, trying, if you were to try to calculate this object using um, you know, an explicit DFT calculation, you would need a, a supercell with 3,500 atoms. So that would be very impractical, okay? So that's the wave function of the electron. What happens to the atoms? So this is the displacements for the fluorine atom. So fluorine is a negatively charged ion. So what it will do is to be repelled by the electron charge, which is negative. So the fluorine will all try to move away from the center of the polar, and that's the shape that it will take, okay? If I were to show you the, uh, uh, the, flu the, uh, the lithium, that would basically move the other way around. So this is about the, 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 the wave function and the, and the, uh, and the, the atomic displacements. But maybe we can do something more. So I told you, sorry, if I go back, that one can expand the wave function in terms of these block states. So uh, we can also ask uh, what are the, uh, which are the most important block states that form uh, the polar. So I can try to look at these coefficients to, to understand what is going on here. And if you try to look at these coefficients, you'll discover the following. So this is the bus structure looking for, right? If you plot the coefficient square as a circle, so the larger the circle, the larger this coefficient, you discover that only the very bottom of the conduction band is involved in the formation of the polar. And if you go to the photons, you discover that only the top of the longitudinal optical band is involved. So these are phonons at Q equals zero. So this is essentially long wavelength longitudinal optical formula. So this means that we are looking at a furlish type electron phonon interaction or polar phonon interaction. Please note that there is also a contribution from uh, uh, these branches. These are acoustic branches of piezoelectric character, but it has to do with the polar nature of this compound. So if you combine this piece of information, let's say polar from the bottom of parabolic band, and this piece of information, only longitudinal optical forms contribute, and you ignore this part uh, just for simplicity, this uh, would lead you to say that uh, this electron polar is what in the literature is called a furlish type polar, okay? Or large electron polar. 
can can we see something else in this structure? So maybe we can look at what happens if we remove a hole, uh, an electron here. So if you look at the whole program, you know, the bus structure is a little bit different, so we may expect us maybe a slightly different behavior. If we remove an electron uh, from the valence, we find a completely different scenario. So the size of the figure here is the same as before, but you can see that it's much more zoomed in. So in practice, this object, which is the whole polar, spans two unit cells. So before we have 11 unit cells, now we have two unit cells. So this is a tiny polar, and uh, uh, so that's a, a very different phenomenology. If this is tiny in the real space, we can expect that the, the expansion, the reciprocal space will be very broad. And in fact, if you do the same analysis as before, you could discover that all the entire band throughout the brilliant zone is involved in the formation of this polar. Okay. And similarly, if you look at the phonon, the entire branches, okay, the yellow branch and the teal branch are involved in the formation of this polar. So this is a completely different scenario from the Frelish polar. And if you go to the literature, this resembles what people have called in the past the hosting small polar. Okay. So what is the bottom line here? The bottom line is that uh, by doing these calculations, we are not assuming that a crystal will have a certain type of polar and we're not making a model uh, uh, you know, with some assumptions. We are just uh, using these polar equations, solving them and then seeing what comes out. And after that, we decide what kind of polar is hosted by the system, okay? So this is uh, more general than a, a model where you make an assumption about uh, what kind of polar you're studying. So if you want to look at the energetics, uh, this is a, a schematic presentation of the energy of these objects. Uh, so this is the conduction band again, valence band. So this is the total energy difference between the ground state with an electron here and the localized ground state. So it's what we would call the quasi-particle energy, not the sham energy. So this is 0.2 electron volts more stable than the delocalized solution. For the hole, which is much more localized, this is almost two electron volts more stable than the delocalized state. So this actually is quite interesting because this means that if you are describing, for example, uh, the, uh, the electronic properties of the valence band of a system like this one, a delocalized block feature may not longer be adequate. So we need to upgrade the technology that we use in order to study uh, wave functions that are really, really localized, okay? So this would require some kind of changes in what we are currently doing. And uh, I should also emphasize that these two kind of renormalizations are on top or what we discussed on Tuesday coming from the far middle and the deep by wall itself energy, okay? So this is an extra effect that uh, has to do with localization and that was not taken into account in the format that I described on Tuesday. Uh, now, let me give you a couple of uh, 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 words about the uh, self-interaction if I have a couple of minutes. So I told you that if in DFT there is a big problem which is called self-interaction, we are all aware of self-interaction problems and so we were born with it probably. But in the case of polarons, this problem becomes much more acute than in the standard DFT calculations. Because whenever you have a delocalized block state, the self-interaction is kind of washed out by the fact that the electron wave function is very delocalized, so the effect is minimized. Typically, self-interaction is very strong when you have a strongly correlated system with localized D electron or F electron, for example. So you can guess that when you start looking at uh, localized polarons, yeah, the effect of self-interaction inter self will kick in and will uh, kind of perturb and uh, this kind of uh, damage your calculation somewhat. To understand it more precisely what happens, let me use the, the landau pekar model because it's really instructive. So this is the same equation I showed you at the beginning to, this, to derive this very simple model of the polar. So the interesting bit is that this contains information similar but not identical to DFT calculation because this model does not have any self-interaction. If we wanted to make it more similar to DFT calculation, we should add a self-interaction. So this would be the heart interaction of the polar with itself. So this would be present in any DFT calculation we do, okay? Now you see that this term here is very similar to this integral. So if you combine the, the, the prefactors, you can make the expression a little bit more, more compact. So this is the new equation and the, the coefficient here has been slightly modified. So what is interesting about this coefficient is that the high frequency dielectric permittivity of any material is larger than one and the, 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 the static dielectric permittivity is larger or equal to the, the, the high frequency permittivity. So if you consider these two uh, constraints, you discover that this bracket is a number, a real number between minus one and zero, okay? This means that this quantity is a negative quantity. When you add, when you include the minus sign here, you are turning something that in the picture I showed you at the beginning was a attractive potential into something that becomes a repulsive potential. So the kinetic energy already tends to delocalize polarum, 
these will also tend to delocalize pollens. So when you add self-interaction, the pollen will be completely delocalized in this lambda operator moment. So what happens in DFT in practice? When you use uh, uh, DFT plus U or use uh, hybrid functionals, the let's say uh, the let's talk about maybe hybrid functions, the, the fraction of the exact exchange, what is it doing is to compensate for the self-interaction by canceling part of the self-interaction. Okay. And that's why it gives you some uh, localized polarons in some cases. However, the extent or cancellation of the self-interaction is only partial in as to do with the, the fraction of that exchange. So by tuning this fraction, you are actually deciding how much self-interaction you are removing, and that changes the size of your polarons in practice. Okay. In fact, one can show that in this model, the size of the polarons, if you use this kind of uh, a, 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 a fraction of exact exchange here, the polar will be directly related to this fraction, this polar size, and the energy will be directly related to the, to the fraction of that exchange. So this is to say that it is extremely important uh, uh, to take care of self-interaction in the study of polarons using uh, density functional theory. Now, I just want to uh, give a last slide to uh, say where we are in the development of these methods compared to the best that is available in the literature. I would say that the best in terms of what we know about polarons comes, comes from a model that uh, is uh, due to find money. This was for 1955, where he used the path integral method to find the total energy of the polar in the Froelich model. So this is not uh, for any polar type. This is one parabolic electron band coupled to uh, the specialist optical phonon uh, that is coupled uh, via, via the Froelich interaction. So the matrix element is one divided the way back, one over two, okay? The ones that has to be added extra in, let's say, in EPW calculations due to polar corrections. So this is an extremely simplified model that does not capture the complexity of real materials, but is the only one for which we have so much information we can perform reasonable comparison. So this model was derived basically by hand by Feynman, but it has since been confirmed by the extremely sophisticated diagrammatic Monte Carlo calculations that give energies very close to these, to these blue lines. Okay. So this is the energy as a function of the polar on coupling strain. And for reference, I'm placing here the total energy we obtained from our initial calculations of lithium fluoride. So you can see we are not yet there, okay? Lithium fluoride is not exactly a, just a foolish uh, kind of tolerant compound uh, because there is also the piezoelectric interaction, but it's tell you that uh, obviously the formalism that we have today is still missing some of the correlations between electrons and phonons. So some work is still needed to match this kind of uh, benchmark tests. So where, uh, are, uh, so where is that uh, things work better? On the uh, left-hand side, there is something that we call the weak coupling limit. So things uh, alpha going towards zero. So what we know today is that in this limit, the cumulant expansion gives, uh, that I showed at the beginning, gives quasi-particle energies, no, not the satellites, the quasi-particle that follow this trend, okay? Is linear in the alpha parameter. So that's good. And on the other hand, in this, uh, on this side, the ab initial equations I gave you and the landau picker model uh, give a trend that follows this line, although there is an offset uh, that has to do with this constant, okay? So in practice, where we are today is that we can calculate the wave function and the extent and the decomposition into a, a kind of a block states throughout this range. But for the energetics, uh, we are still uh, uh, trying to understand how to get the energy correct and accurate throughout the entire energy range. We know what to do here, we know what to do here, but there is still a question of what to do to capture the intermediate range, okay? So uh, that brings me to, to take on messages. We now have two approaches essentially to look at polarons quantitatively. One is the many body approach, it allows us to look at spectral functions, but we don't have, a, uh, and it's good for a weak coupling, but we don't have wave functions. The other one is a density function of perturbation theory, gives us wave functions, but it does not give us spectral functions and no polar on satellites. So what we believe at this point is that uh, to move forward and to become quantitative in the side of polarons, we will need to merge these two approaches and that is probably gonna be the, the next challenge that we have to face. And once this is resolved, possibly we will be looking at, uh, you know, it would be nice to be looking at uh, properties like transport and see what are the implications of these things into functional properties of materials, as opposed to just characterizing the shape and energy of the uh, polarons. So for references, let me just say that uh, the review uh, uh, by Cesare Franchini I already mentioned is a, is a must read. So then there are review papers by Joseph De Vries, who is an authority in the field of polarons. He is basically summarizing 
very accurately most uh, uh, models, let's say non initial models of polarons that you can find. And then uh, the, 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 the polaron equation described as, as presented in these papers, cumulant expansion for polarons in this paper. Then there is also cumulant expansion by this group of, um, uh, 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 the group of Xavier Gons. And there is a, a, a paper by uh, Marco Bernardi's group about uh, an alternative way of looking at polarons, uh, uh, alternative to what I just described. So all these papers are really interesting and worth reading. And with this, I will stop. And uh, uh, if there is time for questions, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Feliciano, for this very uh, insightful talk, which is reflected in the bombarding of questions. So we try to clear a few, but there are still many. So can, can you see them or do you want me to read them? Uh, I think we can we can do uh, five or six of them and then I think we will yeah. go to the break. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry. So is polar satellite and formal satellite the, 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 the same thing? Uh, I think, yes. So the, maybe I can go back to... So some people uh, call, uh, let's go to this one, which is cleaner. So some people call these uh, phonon satellites or phonon sidebands. Some people call them polar on satellites. They are the same thing, yes. So uh, Jorge, Jorge in, uh, in, size, hi, Jorge. in size 16, the interaction looks like uh, the self-interaction that will be removed by exchange. Why this is not the case here? So it's like 16. Uh, Uh, so this actually, uh, this is uh, uh, not the case because uh, the, that self, so let me maybe show it in the uh, DFT equations. Uh, that's easier for me. Uh, so what you are mentioning actually is not the, so the self interaction that is bad is polar on to polar on. So is this one to this one, okay? That is not present in the land optical model. What the optical model has is interaction of this one with the wave function of the polar. Okay, so that should be there, and that is what is captured by these dielectric constants. Uh, then next question is: Can a polaron also be stabilized in two D? Is the two D function of formal screening changed? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, 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 I can tell you that. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so Danny uh, uh, is actually currently working on polarons in two dimensions. Some preliminary results uh, uh, indicate that uh, yes, you can find polarons in two dimensions. Uh, uh, you know, this is not published yet. And for accidents, people use the momentum space width or active spectra to extract the real space distribution. What's the difference between accidents and polarons to make the uh, to make this not the case for polarons? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let me uh, uh, try to explain it with this cartoon. Uh, So if you see this cartoon, basically, let's say that this is the Fermi level, okay? So the polarons will basically, uh, or maybe I can show it uh, maybe here. So the polarons actually have the same extent as the wave vector of the Fermi level, okay? So in other words, uh, maybe actually here it's more clear. So this is the extent of low uh, carrier density. Increasing the carrier density, the extent grows, and increasing the carrier density goes even bigger. So what is growing is not, the, the type of size of polarum, what is growing is the KF, is the size of the Fermi surface, okay? So uh, this is limited by the size of this, the Fermi surface. That's the, the, you know, what happens in the case of polarums at least. The next question in the land car model, stable polarum state can be always found. Is it also true for covalent semiconductor like silicon? That's a, a very, uh, you know, beautiful question. Uh, I don't know the answer. We are trying to find out actually. Uh, my suspicion is that uh, 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 there will be uh, let's say theoretically, I think, I mean, at least this is just a guess. Okay, so don't uh, 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 quote me on this, but I think there should always be some localized uh, object theoretically, if you don't include any other interactions. For example, if you add, if you have a polar which is more stable than the, lo the localized state by, let's say one microvolt, you know, in any real material that will never be found. Okay, so I guess in places like silicon, the binary edge will be so small that in practice you don't find any uh, stable polarum. But I don't know the, the, the real answer because we didn't do the calculation yet. Then, how again in slide 11 for the cluster expansion, do you consider only first order vertices? Uh, if you do the Halley material, the should, should include a second order vertex. Second order, third, and yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, the way uh, this is done is uh, uh, using something called the cumulant expansion method. So in the cumulant expansion, one, one does is to, 
is to include more uh, uh, of these vertices by using an exponential answer. So basically, one I don't have the equation here, but one raises the Green's function as the non-interactive Green's function times exponential of the cumulant. The cumulant contains this self-energy. So if you expand the, the exponential, you will have many powers of these matrix elements. So there are many orders, and that's why one has many uh, one can have many satellites. The caveat is that the cumulant does not contain all interactions. Okay, so there is a lot of correlation effects that are not taken into account. So this is good in some cases, but we don't have enough of our statistics to say that this is universal. Okay. Uh, then uh, can we use polar calculations in glassy materials? Uh, so uh, the calculations I presented are for uh, you know require uh, uh, you know essentially bus structures and phonon dispersions. So um, uh, certainly one is like using EPW to do calculations for uh, you know at the gamma point. I think it's in doable in principle, but probably inefficient in practice. So I, I would not say that that is uh, good, you know something. So this format is probably not useful for those things. Then when been was there a type of expansion of polar and carbon constant on the slide 18? I went in. Uh, was there a typo? I thought the first denominator of the right hand side should be the vacuum permittivity rather than the static uh, dielectric constant. So, sorry, yeah, this is probably, uh, yeah, that's right. So, uh, maybe uh, this is a typo. So, this is the dielectric permittivity of vacuum. So, this is the static dielectric permittivity of the material. Thank you. So, uh, next one is the Method into the transition form physical, or is an artifact of periodic boundary? Also, a very good question. Uh, the answer uh, is that uh, we are uh, uh, currently investigating this question. Okay, we, we, it's something that we don't know, uh, but uh, we are looking into it. And then, for me, uh, can the quantitative mobility be calculated in the presence of polarons? Uh, not yet. So, as I said, uh, this is one of the grand challenges, and uh, we will hope to, to, to be able to do that. But I think it's not a trivial question, and it, it will require some work, both on the side of theory and method development. Okay, hello. Uh, are there any other interesting facts that could appear to do polar on polar interactions? Uh, that basically will require one to. Um, so, the formalism that I described uh, is for, uh, let's say, single particle objects. To study polar on polar interactions, one needs to basically uh, incorporate the effect of exchange and correlation between polarons. Uh, we haven't done that. My guess is that one has to uh, upgrade the formalism to look at two particle wave functions. For example, there's a lot of literature in the, in the, uh, in the model, let's say Hamiltonian world on bipolarons that is extremely interesting. We are not there yet. And that's again, another thing that would be very interesting to try just that uh, uh, you know, all these things will require some time. Does the whole polar uh, have a satellite? Uh, in principle, they should, but uh, they're not being observed. Uh, simply because uh, basically measurements of uh, you know the valence band are very difficult in, in insulators because uh, uh, you know there is uh, you charge them. So if you don't open an insulator, you charge the material, and that uh, messes up the alignment of the arc spectrum. So that's why you don't see you don't see measurements of pure valence bands of insulators in arcs. Okay, to calculate the polar unit right by page 24 is the foolish term for the electron phenomenal element included. 24. Yes, that's correct. Actually, that dominates the electron phonon coupling in the electronic phase. So if the foolish term is removed, you don't get anything. Then the, for the visualization, I suspect there should be fidel oscillations like behavior if we sum up the electronic and ionic charges. Is there a way to, uh, to confirm it? So Friedel oscillations yeah, should happen uh, when you are looking at uh, uh, basically as, as an electron C, okay? So the, these calculations as of now, so what they aim to is to look at the limit of a polar in the middle of nowhere. So uh, one polar in the middle of an infinite crystal. So in this case, there will be no uh, Friedel oscillations. When you start bringing them together, so you go, you create basically a Fermi level, then there should be something like that, but we have not investigated it. So we cannot do many polarons at this stage. And then is it correct to say the first polar is a plasmon induced polar, while a hosting polar, a phonon induced. Well, Froelich and, and, and hosting are both phonon induced. So in all of the things that we discussed, there is no electron plasmon interaction. Okay. Um, however, I should also say that. Uh, 
for example, uh, see this I didn't discuss because it would require a, a slight detour, but in this experiment, for example, so uh, so this experiment here, when the experimentalists cranked up the charge carrier density, basically one starts observing also satellites coming from electron plasmon interactions. Okay, so there is something that one may call plasmonic tolerance. So that requires adding also the electron electron self energy like in GW to be studied. So that's outside of the scope of this uh, lecture and of these slides. Okay, and then uh, in actual lines, you will know that the hole can be cut in the so called, uh, okay, yeah, the these uh, color centers. Can we find the solution other than the one shown by the slides? Uh, so that's a very good point. So that would require, uh, so in these slides, Let's say that uh, the what is being solved is a problem where the system is a pure system with an essentially a perfect crystal, so there is no uh, color center. What you're asking could be done by adding here the potential of a color center. In fact, this is exactly the way that it was done by Pekar when uh, studying polarons in the presence of defect centers. Okay, so I suspect that this is something that could be done. But it will require some, uh, uh, you know, extra work, obviously. And then, why the electron polar and hole polar in the same material, in fact, exhibit very different behavior? I think the um, the simplest answer is that if you look at the band structure, okay, here the the, the bands are very uh, so uh, are much uh, narrower than in the in the in the valence. In the valence, you have the very flat bands, so the bandwidth is very small. So this is kind of the same phenomenon that you find when you compare. Weakly correlated systems like semiconductor in strongly correlated systems, you know, the, the bandwidth tells you the strength of the uh, correlation. In this case, the bandwidth tells you the strength of the electron flow interaction. How expensive is the calculation? Uh, it's, uh, I would say, is uh, 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 similar to calculations of, a, of a, a mobility, for example. So one has to set up uh, uh, the electron flow matrix on a large grid and then solve a linear system. Possible to, is it possible to employ self interaction correction for non collinear calculation or calculation tolerance? Uh, I think uh, uh, that would be uh, 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 in principle, yes. In practice, we have not tried. So then, Claudio, right, Claudio, you, uh, using charge diffusion simulation similar tolerance is what they use in molecular physics. Very systems, I may see an additional complication that is the need to, of background charges for the electrostatic potential. Does this influence the size of this results of calculation? Uh, Yes, yeah, so basically what happens is that the background charge goes away uh, uh, in this uh, uh, formalism uh, because you, you basically don't see it anymore here. And uh, that comes from the fact that uh, I, I did not uh, show that in this equation, in this uh, 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 here, just because I want to be a bit quite quicker. But one should add, when you add this extra charge, one should also add a background charge. When you take the functional derivative, so you obtain this, uh, of this functional, that extra charge goes away in practice, okay? But if you do a DFT calculation explicitly, that is included. So the details can be found in the uh, paper by uh, Danny. There is also a long PRB with all these details. And then Walter, uh, uh, what is the relation between the full normalization of the gap versus poor information? Does it mean DFT breaks down? Yeah, that's a, a very interesting question. Um, so uh, what I can say is that we are investigating this issue and uh, basically the, the renormalization that is done using you know, many bandwidth like Hamida D by Waller. Uh, if you look at the calculations that uh, you know, we did and many other groups like Xavier and many others did, they, these calculations all assume at some point that the electron self energy, sorry, yeah, the electron form of self energy uh, has the symmetry of the crystal, okay? So the calculation as shown here, the lead to localization would imply that the uh, self energy does not break that kind of uh, periodicity, okay? So that is not taken into account in those calculations. So this effect will go on top of that one and has not been included so far because uh, all calculations were periodic basically. Then Sabine, uh, do you allow the ground state density to adapt? Oh, that's a very good question. So yes, the, the ground state density here is, is frozen, okay? So this is uh, one approximation that is used. So the rationale for this is simple. If you have a, a very large polarum, the change in density coming from this extra wave function is tiny. So there is no need, that will not affect the charge density. If you have a very small polarum in a large supercell, 
most of the density will be unchanged, but it will only change near the pole. Okay, so for that, essentially, we assume that the effect will be small. To then, one may ask, but then can you get something as you will get in hybrid functions? So actually, I had a, a backup slide to, to show that. So this method, if you do it for lithium oxide and you compare it to an HSC calculation with a suitably tuned exact exchange fraction, you find basically the same polarizing function. So that should be reliable. And that's very similar to what one does implicitly for excitons. When you calculate an exciton, you don't go changing the density in the valence. You just assume that that doesn't change anymore, okay? And finally, can heading beam equations provide similar results to solve the set up for our problem? Uh, that's uh, the you know the million dollar question. Uh, actually, uh, one of the TAs assisting the school, uh, John Lafuente, is working precisely on this problem. So I cannot anticipate anything because it's uh, you know uh, he may be able to tell you something maybe in the uh, uh, breakout rooms if you want. And then to gauge both to get getting the right degree of certain interaction cancellation is there a generalized optimum theorem to guide? Uh, so the idea that we want to uh, try to uh, uh, advocate for is that we don't need we don't want to 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 worry about that we want a formalism so this one that completely eliminates the the problem from the start if one wants to give the calculation explicitly and uh, try to gauge the right uh, fraction exact exchange there is a very nice paper uh, uh, by uh, um, uh, by Cocot and co-workers that's from the group of Matthias Schaeffer and Christian Carbonio at FHI, where they analyze exactly this problem. So I would uh, refer to that for, uh, for uh, uh, this uh, answer. And then Vladen, how would you distinguish large problems from the effective mass states in chemically doped um, uh, uh, semiconductors? Uh, so yes, what, what you mean, I guess you mean, uh, uh, how do you distinguish large problems from uh, 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 the, the trapped states attached to an ionic uh, impurity, I suppose. Uh, I think they're friends, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you, you know, that's, I think there, there is some, actually, if you look, go to the, the review by Cesare Franchini, he discusses precisely this aspect in relation to the measurement on titania that I mentioned. And what they, they, they suggest is that if you combine evidence from STM and from transport, you can tell that the, what is being called a polar is not an electron trapped to an impurity, but is really an object that is uh, detached from impurity and is in uh, a portion of the crystal that is, uh, you know, basically free of impurity, so like a perfect crystal. All right. Yeah, I guess for the to, for the uh, yeah the the, the VK center uh, again the question is that uh, the answer is that uh, one could upgrade this format, but we haven't done it and. Uh, we first, we need to, to, to work more on the formalist before getting there. But you know, if anybody has any ideas, we'd be welcome to, to, you know, to discuss them. You know. All right. All right. I guess thank you. thank you very much. Yes, I, we, we went a bit uh, beyond, but I think uh, it was very interesting. And based on the amount of question, I think there was a big interest in, in the topic. So I think it's fine to, to just go a bit above. Um, so uh, what we can do is then we, we're going to close now and we're going to reconvene in exactly 10 minutes so that we have time to. Uh, take a coffee or something, uh, and then we will do the hands-on. So thank you, uh, Feliciano. Thank you, Roxana, for the great talks. Uh, so now we're going to uh, leave, and we're going to all uh, re-log in exactly 10 minutes using the same link. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.